The State of AI Report is one of my personal favorite acts of service to the AI community. Every year, Nathan Benesh and his collaborators prepare a very long, very in-depth slide deck covering some of the year's most important news in research, industry, politics, and more. If you listen to my conversation with Nathan from last year, you'll know he's particularly excited about applications of AI to the life sciences and that he contributes to the community in a number of other ways, including advocating for better policies on university spinouts. This episode is a reflection on what has been another crazy year for the field. Nathan and I discuss a number of important trends in research, including industry dynamics, as well as moves towards and away from open source, the continuing demand for NVIDIA chips and their lifetime value, regulatory camps and progress in global governance, AI safety and the attention it's getting from policymakers, and much else. This is the Gradient Podcast, and I am your host, Daniel Bashir. If you enjoy these episodes, you can follow us wherever you're listening to this podcast episode. You can also follow us on Substack to get regular notifications whenever we release a new article, newsletter, or podcast episode. You can also find our online magazine at thegradient.pub, where we regularly publish essays by the sorts of people I interview on the podcast. And finally, if you enjoy the episode, it would mean a great deal to us all if you'd consider leaving us a review on whatever podcast player you're using to listen to this episode. It helps more listeners like you find what we're doing and helps us bring in more interesting guests for you to listen to. But now... Without further ado, Nathan Benesh. Nathan, I'm excited that we're getting to do another year of this, talking about the State of AI report. And given that it's December already, as well, just kind of a, a year roundup for what's been happening in AI. And where I want to start is last year, I had the opportunity to speak with you about the fifth State of AI report. Now we're on the sixth. I'd love to hear a little bit about what's been going on for you in the past year with Airstreet Capital, with Spinout.fyi. You've had a lot of summits, a lot of events. Just what's been what's been going on in life? Yeah, what's well, been keeping us busy? Um, it's good, definitely good to be back and chatting with you here. Uh, it's like the the probably the biggest news for us on the Airstreet side was raising and closing the second fund, uh, which is now 121 million, and so it's a uh, yeah, it's a big opportunity, big vote of confidence from our institutional investors. And um, I think it's just an amazing time to be in the business investing in early stage AI companies. Congrats. So we plan to do, uh, thanks a lot. Yeah. Uh, we plan to continue doing the same work we've been doing for the last couple of years, just having uh, more resources to take bigger swings. And um, yeah, we'll be doing vertical SaaS, Devon Infra, um, and biotech, defense, um, and other kind of domains that. Uh, you know, we think machine learning can make a big uh, positive impact in. And then um, perhaps then on the more extracurricular work, uh, as I sometimes put it, uh, we've been uh, pretty vocal over the last like two and a bit years around uh, policy for forming companies out of university inventions. Uh, so basically this topic of university spinouts. Um, and two and a bit years ago, uh, put together an essay in the Financial Times to uh, make a point as to why um, I thought the UK and Europe was um, not being particularly uh, supportive and productive um, for entrepreneurs wanting to commercialize their inventions and proposed um, some policy changes that would make it uh, more effective and why this was a particularly important time to do it. Um, and so over that two year period, I mean, I think we, um, uh, we you know, received a lot of pushback from pretty much every different type of constituent, whether that's you know, government, uh, research agencies, uh, university tech transfer offices, um, some investors who are um, um, sort of more hell bent on keeping the system the way it was. Um, but we got a lot of support from, from founders and proto founders. Um, and it culminated uh, earlier this year with the start of uh, an official review run by uh, the UK government and um, the head of the University of Oxford. and. Uh, venture capitalist uh, in at the University of Cambridge, and they published their work about two weeks ago, which basically um, 
we've basically pushed forward all the recommendations we've been pushing for, uh, which is uh, limit equity take rates for companies to um, sort of levels that are much more conducive to long-term success. So for software, that's like zero to 10% dilutable and for biotech is 10 to 25, um, which, which I think is still, still too high, but much better than where we came from. And then, um, you know, limiting the amount of time that uh, it would take for a company to um, go from, hey, I want to start a business to getting the kind of stamp of approval. And, um, and then crucially uh, pushing forward with this agenda of transparency, which is basically an extension of the spin out the FYI database that I've been crowdsourcing for the last two years. So um, now universities will be pushed to publish all of their deal terms and publish all of um, their historical uh, terms that they agreed with, with university spin outs, which I think should drive a lot more um, kind of fair innovation and make, uh, make founders more effective at coming out of university and starting companies. Yeah, this is this is really exciting progress. How does it, I guess, first, how does it feel to have, you know, a lot of the recommendations you made kind of start to, to be taken seriously and implemented now? Um, I mean, it's been, it's been such a long time that I've been uh, talking about this. So it's, uh, it's, it just feels like a, a, another day in this like, long journey. Um, I think it is, but like stepping back, I, I do think objectively, this is probably the biggest um, reform to the university's like spin out sector that we've probably ever seen. Uh, I mean, to have actual government intervention come in and say like, this is not conducive to, you know, us trying to, you know, be a science superpower, us trying to, you know, really have, um, you know, important position on the world stage and enable um, these companies to really be successful. So I think it is a big, a big achievement, you know, of course, um, universities still have to keep up their end of the bargain and, and actually implement their recommendations. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think the idea of a science superpower, of course, we are later going to talk a little bit about your, your European dynamism report, but I think that's a theme we'll kind of see come up a few times today. Yeah, very much. What else has been on your radar this past year? Any You've been having a lot of summits, events. I was at your, your SF launch party for the State of AI report. So and anything else that you want to bring up that's been going on? Yeah, we, um, we ran for the seventh or so time, our Research and Applied AI Summit in London, um, which is, you know, really exciting. Like, I think it's been two years since we brought everybody in person. And it's still quite incredible to see how the how the kind of constituents in the room have changed over the years. Uh, you know, like lots, lots of new topics kind of popping up, like science policy, like um, uh, biotech, uh, you know, autonomy and, and uh, national security and other topics like that. Um, we kind of didn't transition from there into a couple of more in-person uh, meetups, sort of expanding this kind of London AI and Paris AI events that we've been doing in Europe for a while, both in New York and SF, as you mentioned. And, um, and the idea with, with doing the in-person state of AI report launch was, you know, we've uh, traditionally, um, you know, published the report just online and then um, continue the conversation there. Uh, maybe next year we'll, we'll do a, a magnet link drop. It seems to be pretty popular now, <laughs> <laughs> perhaps more effective. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, so we kind of, you know, took, took an event to, to SF and then got together with 100 people or so and some key contributors, like the folks um, at Meta pushing all the Llama work and then biotech recursion and then some of the Asian work with, um, with Adept. And just to, it's just a cool way to sort of, for us to like say thanks to the community for producing all this amazing work that then we can uh, chew on over the summer and, uh, and, and, um, you know, help more people who perhaps like see some of it as a bit, uh, difficult to, uh, to digest and, you know, increase the aperture into the space. Uh, and for us to also, um, yeah, keep, uh, keep kind of fresh with the knowledge and, um, and, you know, I've been, been very invested in community for, for most of my career and I'm, I just really enjoy it, frankly. Yeah, I think it's, it was really exciting just to see how many people you were able to get together. And the, I, I remember listening to the folks from Meta talking about Llama and you had some really interesting questions for them. I think you have the, your, your keynote up online somewhere, right? I think it would probably be good for folks who are interested to, to go and give that a listen. Yeah, 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 yeah. I made a basically an abridged uh, version of this data AI, which is forty or so slides, but a director's cut. Yeah, well, I think this is a good place for us to to start diving in. I'd love to start maybe at a super high level with what for you was maybe 
the most surprising or, or kind of interesting personally this year. And that can be from the state of the report or, or in the couple of months since then. I think the big message uh, that we had last year was, and, and remember like last year was like the stum- summer of stable diffusion uh, when everything like really lit off. So it's, it's um, really wasn't that long ago, but the, the narrative back then that we kind of crafted and I think was prevalent in the industry was, you know, big tech's not really doing very much. Um, uh, you know, key contributors from big tech are leaving to do things outside of big tech. And there are some examples of kind of new companies getting formed. Um, but you know, there was a lot of energy in the open source community in this like distributed decentralized collectives, uh, remember a lot of work around Luther and discord channels and, uh, this sort of like arm the rebels as it were against big tech companies. And, um, and, that, and then like in the 12 months since then, uh, you know, obviously like big technology companies are not like asleep at the wheel. They just have a different set of kind of circumstances to work within. Um, and so we've snapped back to, you know, large players and pretty much every software company like on the NASDAQ basically is like doing something uh, in machine learning, whether that's uh, with their own initiatives or using third party models. Um, so it, it feels, you know, investing in the space, but also working in it like there's probably no other uh, shining light in the technology world outside of machine learning. So it's like this, this, this like previously tiny world has been put under a magnifying glass with like the sun shining at it. And so it feels like immensely competitive and, um, and, uh, and you know, what, what, what was white space is now like populated with like a dozen companies and teams working on the same thing. Um, and so, so yeah, it's intense competition, exciting, uh, stressful. Um, but, but I think, um, I think the good part, um, and, and I kind of talk about this with, with, uh, startup founders is like, you know, 10, 10, five, 10 years ago, you had to really be skilled in the nuances of, of machine learning to be able to, uh, you know, build models and like contribute something. And it would oftentimes take you a year or two years to get anything remotely useful off the ground and, you know, go test if anybody in the real world would want to use it. Um, oftentimes they wouldn't, and then you'd run out of runway and that was it. Um, whereas now, uh, you, you can, you can basically like borrow all these capabilities from third parties and iterate at the speed of SaaS companies, which I think is really cool. And it's bringing a lot of new participants into this space that, um, you know, weren't there before. Um, and so I think, you know, next year's report will probably see all sorts of kind of funky, new, interesting, um, applications that, you know, machine learners hadn't drawn up, but like subject matter experts did. Yeah, for sure. We're definitely at a point where if you're a strong engineer and you can architect and sort of stitch things together and have the technical skills to go about it and do a little bit of prompt engineering, you can build something pretty cool. I went to this AI wellness hackathon earlier in the year and worked on a team of around five people. And I want to say there were two folks on the team who were actual like AI research scientists. And they did a a lot of the prompt engineering stuff and everyone else, all the rest of us, I I did a little bit of prompt engineering work here and there too, but the rest of the work was really just like stitching all the APIs together and figuring out, like, we wanted to end up building this, this therapy chatbot. And what we ended up with was this super, like, it was, it was a very rude chatbot. You'd like tell it your problems and it'd be like, oh no, you're never going to have a good life just because, you know, you, I don't know, lost your keys or something. It was I was, I was a fan. You built Grok, basically. Basically, yes. Grok before Grok. We should have marketed it that way. Yeah. Um, four years ago or so, I feel like this definitely would have been a, a pretty big research project of at least a couple of months. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get a little bit into some of the specifics of the report. And, and one of the really big things that you highlight, starting with the research section here, is GPT-4, of course, being really the big thing dropped early in the year. And in addition to that, a move away from openness. And that's been kind of happening with a lot of state-of-the-art models. You you mentioned the stable diffusion moment last year. And simultaneously, we saw Google coming out with their Imogen models with Party, which were also closed source. And since GPT-4, of course, we've we've also had Gemini finally coming out from Google with the technical report at the very least. So 
I'm I'm kind of curious what's been again at the forefront of mind for you when it comes to this I I suppose debate and question of state of the art when it comes to these battles between closed source, open source, and what's going on there. So the paradigm I've seen play out is, um, you know, builders and companies will often choose the path of least resistance that gives them um, the feeling for what a capability can potentially provide, you know, their customers, their internal users. And so they tend to pivot, they tend to focus on um, paid for third party APIs that they can plug and play and, and, you know, run with as you discussed. And I think they, they, they run with that until they validated some product hypotheses. And then at that point, once you sort of see a path to deploying uh, capability at scale or, or, or certainly at larger scale than, than uh, just iterating product market fit, um, you start to have to run the numbers on like, is it cost efficient for me to use this third party? Uh, there are pros and cons to using a third party with regards to control of the weights, uh, potentially, you know, additional fine tuning, um, data privacy, um, also, um, you know, not having necessarily a redundancy um, backup plan um, and and then potentially also like um, some deployment uh, nuances, you know, whether you want your service to be only online or offline, et cetera. And so at that point, you start to figure like, hey, should I should I keep going down this path or should I go open source? And then, uh, and then I think like the the shakeup over the last uh, two weeks or so at OpenAI, which is probably the more most stressful theatrical time in the tech world since SVB, uh, that also I think uh, you know raised some uh, re- not some red flags, but just some some questions of like, it's great that you've been running really fast with this third party, but like, remember that third parties still have vulnerabilities, whether that's people or, or security or whatever. And so, um, so then you start to think, okay, maybe I should have redundancy in the same way that you probably shouldn't just use one bank account, even though that's the most, um, uh, you know, the sort of least frictionful way of running your business. So, um, so yeah, so having said all that, I think, um, I think both threads are, are advancing like very, very quickly for sure. Um, I think open source does have a genuine shot um, and uh, and particularly within sort of vertical specific products where you might not need all of the bells and whistles of a general purpose model and you only care about like search, for example. Um, I think, you know, more recently like Perplexity has shown that in their search engine, sort of like Wikipedia style search engine, um, their internally built model performs better according to the sort of characteristics that their users care about than like a GPT 3.5 turbo. So I think that that paradigm makes makes a lot of sense to me. Yeah. And I think this speaks to, to sort of the benchmarking situation and kind of what's going on with that. And there's a few different tacks on this. One of the things you pointed out in the report was that there almost a, a kind of false promise of small language models being trained to be, quote unquote, just as good as larger language models. And at the same time, though, what you're saying here is when you're interested in really more specific verticals, there are still really good opportunities for getting those to work. And so I'm, I'm curious for you and, you know, maybe when you're talking to founders or people who are interested in building models, whether it's for specific verticals or something more generally, how you're suggesting or, or thinking about what people might want to do when it comes to Again, you, you mentioned some ideas about what they should use potentially in this redundancy idea, but then when it comes to actually training models for things, how do you think about that? Yeah, I think this this topic of benchmarks and evals is is uh, it's like super important and is changing um, you know quite rapidly. And I think the 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 big challenge here is that uh, you know previously you'd build a model for a specific task, and so you ca- you kind of really understood what the downstream application of your model was was and what and, and like how you wanted to tune and adjust it and what benchmarks to use as a function of that but when you're a developer of a of a, of a multi-use system it's super hard for you as a developer to forecast all the downstream uses of your system and so in a way you know the industry is saying hey we need better at benchmarks but it's also um perhaps like unrealistic for you know developers to invent all these benchmarks that can cover all the edge cases that, that models should be used for um, and so that puts even more stress on, on, on these academic benchmarks, which like historically have not really reflected reality because of like, you know, data differences. And now 
probably even uh, you know reflect reality less so because they just less you know, have generally good coverage. Um, and so, so ultimately, I think the benchmarks that matter the most are the ones that are reflective of your product experience and what you're trying to achieve. Sort of like who cares if you don't pass the math exam or something if your product has nothing to do with math. Um, and uh, and then you know the other your topic about about benchmarks, I'd say is um, is we probably also have to start evolving them a little bit if we want to focus them more on like general purpose intelligence. Like for example, you could think about um, measuring success of a model at multiple consecutive skills. Like, hey, do this and then do that and then go back and do this. Uh, as opposed to like doing tests in, in more isolation because you know, humans are clearly capable of doing that. Um, and so, so yeah, so like my recommendation for companies is really like in the same way that you would design a product with, uh, you know, key performance indicators that would determine and describe if your product is successful for whatever you want to achieve, like you should have benchmarks that, um, that are designed in a very similar way. Yeah. The benchmarking for specificity makes a lot of sense because also I think it's probably just true that there is a very small minority of companies out there that actually are interested in building AI systems that could be described as general in any reasonable way. And for those who are, of course, they have their own much larger problem. But there's another interesting thing you brought up during the report too, which in addition to these sort of general purpose LLM leaderboards, when we are looking at general purpose LLMs, a lot of the way people figure out what to trust, what a good model is, turns out to be more of, of a vibe check than, than checking leaderboards. And I think that's something that we kind of see more and more, again, both with general purpose models and generous pur general purpose models that might have some specificity. Maybe, you know, Meta is kind of trying to launch these language models that have personalities and things like this. And that's all really about what the interactive experience is like. And I'm curious what you've noticed over the past year in that regard. Yeah, totally. Um, so the, the, the vibes part, um, I think the first um, setting in which I encountered that was like reading Replit's blog post about how they built their own internal like code gen model, I think it was. Um, and then at the end of it, they're like describing that the best way to check if your system is good in the context of your product is like, just play around with it and see how you vibe with it. Um, and, uh, and, and perhaps like extrapolating more broadly than that in con uh, certainly consumers, I think choose, uh, software as a function of whether it kind of solves their job to be done in a way that they actually enjoy. In particular for like consumer social, like the vibe of the product is a really big part of the experience. And so if you're going to inject, you know, uh, a general purpose model within a product that has a certain feel, it would just be super awkward if like, for example, to take an extreme example, like Salesforce would deploy a bot that was like as playful as a bot that was born in Snap. Like it would just be like weird. Um, and so... So in that sense, I think like vibe should align, the vibe of your model should align with the vibe of your product. And, uh, and I think that's, um, that's actually quite a cool opportunity to inject more personality um, in, you know, whether that's in business software or, or, or consumer, those consumer products. Um, and yeah, to take the like even bigger extreme, you know, products like character and, and meta is kind of bought studio, whatever it's going to be called. Um, is a, is a key example of this too. One thing people are saying about a lot of code gen models in particular, when it comes to this sort of vibes based way of looking at things is that often they seem to generate really Pythonic code, which is interesting. And I think that makes a lot of sense for some of the particular things devs are interested in, particularly the AI community, but that's actually really pretty important. And it makes you wonder, of course, there are a lot of developers like me right now who are using other languages like C++. And yes, you could probably still write C++ code in Pythonic style. But when it comes to a lot of these questions people have about how the job of software development is going to look, I feel like the way these models or the type of style of code that they're good at writing, that might have some pretty important implications for 
what sorts of developer jobs are going to be impacted in the coming few years and exactly how that's going to look too. Is that something you're thinking about at all? I haven't thought um, all of that much about this specific example, but um, but I I do think if the if the sort of like longer term vision is for how, is for everybody to have their own personal AI, then in theory we should we should be allowed somehow to dictate the style of the agent that is helping us in different contexts. Um, and and for sure, maybe for for code you'd want a certain style, and maybe for your own writing you'd want another style, and maybe as an assistant you want a third one. Um, so it could very well be that, uh, like there's a certain branch, I guess, of like prompt engineering, which is more like, uh, imbuing a specific vibe into your model in a more programmatic way or more controllable way. I don't think people really understand how vibes currently emerge. Like I've been constantly interested with this, like curriculum learning idea. And I, and for most people that I meet, like training models, I ask them this question about, like, hey, does the does the out, does your model behavior and capabilities change if you feed it like the one the one hundred one of history first, and then you feed it code, and then you feed it like the more advanced lessons later, or if you invert that sequence as a change? I think a lot of that's focused on capabilities right now, but perhaps the personality is um, I don't know it can also be inferred somewhat from the curriculum. Yeah, that's interesting. I've thought a little bit about curriculum learning in the context of what that implies about learning or, or a model's ability to kind of parse and process language. But when it comes to personality, that seems interesting. One kind of last point on the research section I wanted to talk about was the sort of big issue that people are beginning to notice in lots of ways. And this was Epoch AI's report and the potential exhaustion of human generated data. There are so many different things people have to say about this, I feel. In one domain, I think we've seen a lot of pretty popular articles about what this could look like for the future of writing. Maybe there's a day when people are doing a lot of writing with these AI systems and they're beginning to feed off of their own data. And when you have this kind of lukewarm content, everything begins to look more and more and more lukewarm. And that's just not a world that a good number of people probably want to live in. But then there's also the opportunity for things like synthetic data. And also at the same time, it's it's kind of hard to measure a lot of these questions about the exhaustion of data. So I'm curious what particular threads you followed and, and how your attention got called to this. Yeah, so it's um, it's sort of un unclear to me when, when that might happen or if it will happen or sort of who to trust, because you're right that some people do say like, you know, real data is going to going to be totally used up or perhaps already has and others that are extremely bullish on synthetic data um so at the moment i'm just like very uh open-minded about where all this might go and i do think um there are there are you know a variety of different modalities of data um and there's probably some opportunity to like i don't know take take audio, transcribe it to text, and it becomes a new a new modality. And to some degree, like that translation might be useful or might be accretive to model training. I don't know if we know that yet. Um, certainly what I've seen in biology, which is another domain where you could argue, hey, uh, we have, um, say, say we argue that we've used all of the um, published data that's around today in biology. Well, the way to generate more of that is just to to do and to invent like much higher throughput sequencing um, technology or synthesis technology uh, or cheaper instruments to generate 3D structures of proteins because we don't have like all that many um, empirically determined structures. So I think in the, in the natural domain, there's probably so much more data available that we haven't yet created. Um, it's, it's probably more likely just a, in the human language and text space outside of all like enterprise data silos, et cetera, we might be close to exhaustion. Um, and, and, and yeah, I, I, I don't know whether capabilities of a model would improve if you also train it on protein language data. Um, if, if, if code has been useful for logical reasoning because it is just so explicitly logical, uh, there are, you know, hidden characteristics in protein sequences that reflect function and things like that. Um, so, I don't know, it'd be, it'd be an interesting experiment to run for somebody who's got a lot of money.
For sure. Yeah. When it when, when it comes to generating more data for things like applications in the natural sciences, are you aware of any kind of large scale efforts to work on this sort of thing? Or I guess if you were somebody who was at the helm and thinking about, I would like to develop more powerful models and make sure that we have the data to do so, where what do you think we need to be doing right now for that to happen? So I know I know that you can gather a ton more data in existing databases just because they're very poorly exploited um, in in biology for, for various kinds of sequences. Um, there are also initiatives that are trying to generate much cheaper and uh, kind of pooled higher throughput sequencing. Uh, sorry, not sequencing um, synthesis. Um, so if you have higher throughput DNA synthesis, that's a lot cheaper than you can actually generate all of the potential model outputs from these protein language models, and then you can go and test them. And then there you get, um, you get functional readouts, and then you can use that in sort of software parlance is like RLHF for biology. Um, you, uh, you can also see, um, for example, microscopes getting a lot cheaper. And so we're generating many, many more pictures of cells and different kinds of experiments that are far richer than what we might've had in the past because resolution improves and our experimental approaches get a bit more sophisticated. So, um, so that's what I think all these initiatives are actually undergo and like are actually happening. Um, but in very specific domains where pharma companies or research labs have specific questions they're, they're asking. I haven't seen yet um, sort of like a, a kind of moonshot to just create a ton of data for the purposes of training general purpose systems. Maybe that, that could happen and maybe that is an idea. Yeah, still, still on this topic of applications to the life sciences, one of the themes that we talked a little bit about last year that I think has seen some more development is we talked a little bit about diffusion models and things like the stable diffusion moment. And you mentioned that you were more excited about some of the less obvious applications of things like diffusion models. So this is two applications in biology, chemistry, the life sciences generally. And this was, of course, something that came up again in, in this year's report, what people have been doing there. One of the folks I spoke to recently, Kevin Yang at MSR, has also done some pretty exciting work, I think, when it comes to protein engineering and diffusion models. I'm curious what the biggest movements in that direction that have caught your eye have been. I think the biggest, um, the biggest work there in biology was probably this like ESM2 and ESM fold work where, you know, um, researchers uh, at Meta and now they formed a company just did massively and supervised pre-training across protein sequences and then managed to learn um, kind of statistics about how proteins are structured and how they might function as a, as a result of these evolutionarily like encoded uh, sort of statistics, which I thought was quite, quite cool. And then the second one is also how like these technologies are getting used for much more specific protein design. Um, like for example, you can see how in the UK a couple of weeks ago, and, and then just this week in the U S like the first two genome editor therapies, like CRISPR Cas9 therapies, uh, were approved, uh, in the, in the case of the U S to treat sickle cell anemia, which is like a devastating disease. And in theory, you could treat it with a one shot, um, therapy that would just correct the genomic, um, uh, sort of problem uh, in in patients, and 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 note that like these genome editors were discovered through uh, kind of sequencing and just like random experimentation and improved through uh, trial and error. Uh, but you can imagine using um, these kind of protein language models that have um, much more kind of fine grained control over design to create specific editors for every condition that you really care about. Um, so I think this will, this will happen. Um, I don't know how long it'll take, but I think it is a natural extension of this kind of work. And, and I've seen, um, you know, a few other papers that are also, uh, pursuing this this idea of multimodality, which is clearly becoming very big in the, in the AI tech world, but in the AI bio world, that would mean, um, you know, using protein data, using, uh, DNA data, using sequencing images, et cetera, and then somehow fusing and stitching all that together to have a more holistic understanding of biology. 
Um, and so, so that work is ongoing and I think could lead to interesting places. Um, of course, at the end of the day, you, you, you need to, uh, focus all this energy, at least in the biotech world, to discover and design drugs and push them through the clinic. And there's just some physical realities with with that. So the sort of patience that we need is going to be a, probably at least an order of magnitude longer than what we see in the regular tech world. There's there's always a limiting reagent yeah. isn't there. Um, another, another kind of big theme that came up in this year's report too was, of course, since the last time we talked, the chat GPT moment kind of followed soon after. And the big thing that they said was really the power of reinforcement learning from human feedback on top of these base models and what that could do for the systems you're developing. And so one of the questions you were kind of posing in this year's report, too, was, is RLHF really going to be sort of the state of the art for doing this kind of thing? Or is something going to come along and upend it? And one technique that I've seen mentioned more and more recently in that context has been direct preference optimization, which I think came out of Stanford, a lot of Stanford researchers. I'm curious, again, in this question too, how, like what you've been following, how much you've thought about this direct preference optimization versus versus RLHF question, and maybe where you are on the question you posed in the report. Yeah, so there, um, there are... I think several groups that are working on uh, on this topic and some uh, alternatives. I think just yesterday and probably more given that it's NeurIPS uh, season right now. So research drops are plentiful. Uh, but some folks at Stanford and Contextual AI kind of <clears throat> produced another um, another alternative called Kahneman Tversky optim optimization, um, which is sort of a way of also doing um, an alternative to human uh, pre to human preference learning and reinforcement learning from human feedback. Um, and, and as they describe it, at least pulling up their blog, um, they study the work of, of these economists right, on human decision making. And their alignment method doesn't require preferences like output A trumps output B for input X. But instead for input X, we simply need to know whether an output Y is desirable or not desirable. And their context when they look at how this, um, how you want to uh, align models to preferences in the enterprise setting, you have a lot of this kind of data of if an output is desirable or not desirable in the form of like your customer bought this or didn't buy this, uh, or your customer like churned or didn't churn. Um, and so if this kind of method works, works better, then it's much more approachable um, for, for enterprises. The alternative being, you know, spending a crazy amount of data trying to find experts in uh, in whatever sector you care about, which is um, you know, clearly now the cash cow outside of uh, traditional data labeling. And that sense, I think, is also interesting because, like, when, when we first saw these like um, transformer based models and unsupervised learning, uh, many were saying, "Oh, that's the death of labeled training data because we don't need it anymore." Um, and it, it's certainly like a lot of VCs were saying that. And so it, it seems like that was very, very momentary. We've just shifted a ton of budget away from uh, explicit labeling of training data to it's kinds of like basic movie scripts of interactions uh, in, in specific domains, which is arguably more expensive than people going click, click, click on images and text. Yeah, yeah, I know this, this makes a lot of sense. And I'm kind of curious to see how, how this will all play out. Um, I think this would be a good place to move on to the industry section. And we've begun to touch on a couple of the themes here. The first one I think to talk about is, again, just generally the generative AI applications that have become available in this past year, how people are thinking about them, how people are using them. And I think I've, I've seen like very different takes on this sort of thing. So when it comes to a system like ChatGPT, a lot of people are very excited about the ways they can optimize productivity. At the same time, I saw a pretty interesting article in The Atlantic a few months ago. I think it was by Derek Thompson, and it had a pretty different take on this, that his feeling was most people are actually not becoming significantly more productive as a result of ChatGPT, but most people are just kind of screwing around with it and doing things that for the most part are pretty useless. But by this process of people just messing around with it, eventually you do figure out what's actually useful and productive from these sorts of systems. And he had a pretty historical perspective on this and the way that people have tended to figure out good uses for new technologies. But I think his take was 
we have this technology that's capable of a general range of things. And again, that kind of killer app, if you want to call it that, doesn't really exist yet. I'm curious, though, at least in, in your own uses and what you've been seeing, where you are on this question of, of generative AI applications that exist today, what they're good for, how people seem to be using them and what they're excited about. Yeah, the, the first thing that comes to mind is this, uh, I think there's that study from a BCG that looked at 750 of their consultants and assessed uh, GPT-4, chat GPT's efficiency in assisting them on tasks. And there was like a creative product innovation task and then a business problem solving task. Um, and said, you know, the findings show that 40% performance boost for consultants using the bot for creative product work compared to the control group that didn't use this uh, service. But a 23% decline in product in performance when using it for business problem solving. Um, and uh, interestingly, it says, you know, researchers found that ChatGPT enhanced the performance of nearly all consultants, 90% who used it for creative product performance. Um, <clears throat> but interestingly, the boost was more prominent among low performing employees. We saw 43% increase when using the chatbot versus 17% for top performing employees. So it, 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 it reminds me also of this, um, of these, uh, kind of sale assistive sales solutions like uh, chorus AI or gong where, you know, they listen to your sales calls and, um, and then help you kind of upskill uh, your ability to sell to a customer and really what they're doing is not, you know, helping your, uh, your best agents perform even better. It's level setting everybody else to the level of your best agents. So that intuitively kind of makes sense to me. Um, and I think the same kind of statistics are true for coding, um, from what I've seen with the GitHub copilot results. Um, and in terms of like my, my own use cases, um, I, I tend to use um, like the service mostly for kind of understanding markets. Like if I'm new to a space and I don't know much about it, I'll just try and get like a quick summary, a bit like Wikipedia style. I think somebody online recently described some of these services like Perplexity and others as like a live Wikipedia. Um, and I think that's fairly, fairly accurate. Um, I mean, occasionally I'll use it to solve a coding problem. Um, that I don't, that I can't do otherwise. And it generally works, but, um, hasn't yet been like transformative for me personally yet. Uh, I still write every, every word with my hands. <laughs> mm -hmm. Same. Yeah. I, I still haven't integrated chat GPT into my writing workflow yet. Yeah. Like at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious how you think about, I guess, also this sort of war over general apps. So we've seen, you know, a lot of different companies and, and mostly big ones, of course, kind of coming at this, offering chat GPT like systems. Of course, we had Sydney slash Bing, which was pretty infamous for many reasons. We had Bard come out of Google. And I remember hearing from quite a few people uh, about how good they thought Bard was at least a couple of months ago when they were using it. And now Google is finally going to start integrating Gemini into their system. I'm curious how, like, what's been tracking for you over the past couple of months in terms of where users seem to be going on this, of course, ChatGPT being really the default and most well-known, but given the shakeup uh, with OpenAI and everything, it seems like there is a bit of testiness in the waters. And I'm curious how you're feeling about all this. Yeah, it strikes me that um, all you know, Azure customers and, and, and Microsoft customers have somehow like started to enable ChatGPT for their for their employees. It does seem like it's kind of solved for more of the low level tasks, like just writing, writing stuff, translating stuff, like social media and content, et cetera. Uh, and you know, that might be like a big, a big opportunity as well. Um, um, I think to, to point you to like a really compelling like application uh, software company that you know uses these services and is growing really fast, I think that's Still a bit challenging. Um, I think uh, the multimodality companies have done super well, like whether that's Synthesia doing these kind of avatars um, that can talk any language and present things for you. I mean, that company is growing super fast, and so is Eleven Labs doing the voices. Um, and and so I think there's probably more more innovation and more kind of creative stuff coming in this almost like a consumer -y world than there is an enterprise where an enterprise, everybody's trying to solve the exact same problem, basically. 
like summarizing retrieval and question and answering. Um, and, um, and I think in terms of like which service is really growing, it's, it, it, it's quite surprising and um, that this, this trend of if you're number one and you own your customer's mind share, then that usually ends up per, and you innovate fast enough, like that ends up persisting over a very long period of time. It seems like ChatGPT like is that number one. And so a new service comes out, it like, looks like it's competitive. People play around with it for a bit, but like people still remember ChatGPT and just go back to that. Uh, unless you're like in a very specific kind of vertical or like reinvented the user experience a bit. Um, so just the staying power of like brands is very strong. Yeah, it, it almost reminds me of like the very classic sort of consumer packaged goods way of getting people to become like a lifetime customer of a product, even if it's not the most optimal. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. People still love Coca Cola. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that the next kind of big theme here is has been compute. And you introduced pretty recently, I guess, in the past year the state of AI reports compute index, which is really just speaking to the importance of, well, of course, compute in the AI world. And I think that we've seen a lot of heat up in this space when it comes to NVIDIA launching the H100s, when it comes to the export controls on chips. Um, one of the things that's been noted, of course, has been the shakeup among the competitors to NVIDIA with Cerebrus currently taking the lead, it seems. Again, I'm I'm curious, you know, how you think about it feels like there's at this point a lot of companies that are just really eating up NVIDIA chips. NVIDIA is having trouble keeping up with demand at times. And it seems kind of inevitable that companies are going to eat up as much hardware as they can and sort of explore scaling laws as far as they will possibly go. But if you had to think about maybe it's it's really hard to predict anything, but like I think you have actually an explicit prediction on the largest or, or a company spending like more than $1 billion on training a model in the next year. But I'm curious, you know, what you think the next couple of years might look like when it comes to the state of compute, when it comes to the players on the compute side, and then the people who are using it. My guess is it's still going to be NVIDIA really leading the charge. And then likely, you know, Google's TPU, if they really ramp up like third party availability um much faster uh in a more meaningful way um so i think uh looking at a few of the points that we raised uh in the report so it seems like you know wall street was clearly like taken aback by you know nvidia's crazy blowout earnings which pushed it into the you know, trillion dollar market cap club um you saw you know various nation states snapping up uh deals uh you saw kind of nine figures worth of H100 selling out faster than tickets to Coachella. Uh, you know, large uh, tech companies and also startups kind of uh, flaunting the number of GPUs they had as a way to say like, you know, come, come work here. And, um, and I think the astounding thing for NVIDIA specifically is when we looked at um, uh, the number of research papers that mentioned the usage of a specific NVIDIA chip uh, over time, you know, we saw that last year the most popular chip was the V100, which was uh, released in 2017. And um, and sort of the popularity in AI research follows a bit of this bell curve. And, you know, from the start to the end of the bell curve, describing it quite unscientifically, uh, the number of years is probably around a decade. So it's quite astounding that, you know, research is happening across um, all these different kinds of chipsets, whether they're really sexy ones or they're less sexy ones. Um, but they're... They're, they're relevant for a very long period of time. And, and so I think one of the natural uh, kind of next steps for this is actually proving that, you know, owning and running uh, GPU clouds is a pretty damn good business, provided that there's still demand. And, um, you know, that's because some of these cloud vendors, GPU cloud vendors will bill you, uh, for example, like $3 million or something for one year of, uh, of reserved instance capacity. And that is the cost of buying those chipsets outright. So like you're, ba you're basically like paying back your chips in one year and they last for about 10. Uh, 
And so, and that's like not even going towards uh, like inference because we still we still don't really know what the killer apps are, of course, outside of one or two of them. Um, and so, I think it's becoming like pretty hard for other competitors to really catch up. Um, there are certainly like initiatives that are that are undergoing, whether it's at AMD, uh, you know, at uh, Amazon, and perhaps even Microsoft. Um, but I think. I think for the training market, I, I'd be surprised if there's really more than NVIDIA and perhaps like some smaller companies around the edges. For inference, it looks like, um, you know, new vendors are focusing more on that um, because uh, at the end of the day, like you could, you could really create much more custom accelerators if you know what model you need to serve at a crazy high uh, volume. Um, so you can do much more custom, custom ASICs. Um, and of course, we saw like the the listing of uh, ARM on the Nasdaq, which is uh, quite quite a big deal uh, after all the you know regulatory interventions that you know blocked its acquisition by by Nvidia. So it's been uh, it's been a crazy year, and certainly more to come uh, next year. You can also discuss a bit about the export controls and things like that actually happening. Yeah, this is this is a big one, and I think that from what I recall from your report, of course, Nvidia has been putting out some chips that are geared specifically to circumvent those export controls, and of course, China has been buying those up, and and many of them at that. And there's this this interesting question of it seems like China hasn't been able to really offer anything that works anywhere close to being on the scale of ChatGPT. They had things like ErnieBot but they're not quite there. And I remember this being a much more scary question a couple of years ago, because after GPT-3, China had started launching these models that were much, much larger than GPT-3 was, and that were also multimodal, from what I recall. And so now it seems like this has been a really big kneecap in multiple ways. And I think that the export restrictions on chips and, and on fabs and everything were pretty serious. But it seems like there's still this question of is China going to be able to still use more trailing edge chips that might not be top of the line, but are still kind of good enough, and then maybe figure out the right distributed training strategies or something like this to get around those restrictions. But I'm curious what, again, what you're paying attention to there. Yeah, I mean, there's some quite wild behavior. Like there was a piece quite recently that's diving into how this increasing stringent of U.S. chip sanctions have driven uh, the Chinese state and its industry much closer together. And so it was alleging that you know Chinese government's providing tons of support to Huawei across the chip uh, supply chain, largely in secret, of course, because it's uh, it's banned by the by the U.S. And so these state investment funds are also backing companies that aid Huawei, and Huawei is lending out its engineering expertise and IP to these smaller companies. Uh, to try and boost domestic chip capabilities. Like it's hired uh, some ex-ASML individuals and it still obviously denies receiving special government support. And meanwhile, as you mentioned, like NVIDIA um, has created a sanctions compliant, quote unquote, uh, A A800 and H800 for the Chinese market. But even those ones have recently been hit with uh, US restrictions. So then they designed uh, another chip, the H20, uh, which I believe has been delayed. And then you have uh, you know, the U.S. Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo, warning, quote, if you redesign a chip around a particular cut line that enables them to do AI, I'm going to control it the very next day. <laughs> it's like, it's, I mean, this is borderline comedy um, that it's so public. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, from the perspective of a regulator, I feel like, you know, if their goal really is to totally kneecap China, um, of course, they have to balance, you know, the geopolitical tensions and all this. But I, I can see that kind of quotation being relevant where it's like, OK, you're like creating a chip that is maybe just under the performance needed to be restricted. And that's really not the spirit yeah. of the law yeah. or something. Yeah, 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 exactly. And so I'm very curious, like how regulators are, are thinking about and reacting to this. Cause... Exactly. Yeah. And then like more recently, like the U.S. government also compelled a, Chinese, a Saudi investor, which is tied to Aramco, to divest from a neuromorphic chip company and you know that investor has positions in other kinds of ai companies so it'll be it'll be pretty uh, pretty stressful to watch like how all these like tentacles are exposed i mean not to mention also the the, the sort of 
contention around G42 cloud and whether that organization uh, in the Middle East is connected to China and is like also allegedly trying to like pass state secrets from US tech companies to China. It's just, just the wild west out there. Interesting. Another question I have for you is kind of from from a VC perspective, it feels like there's been some recent cases where companies are drawing in a lot of funding on the orders of maybe hundreds of millions. And you can basically see that almost, if not all of this funding is intended for literally just buying up GPUs or for compute spend. In a sense, like this is kind of inevitable to an extent. It's it's hard to avoid because of the way that people have to play the game now. But again, as somebody who's, you know, investing, advising companies, thinking about how do those companies spend their money? How do you think about this way in which, you know, we're now just allocating kind of unheard of sums of money towards just compute? Yeah, I mean, from the investing side, like certainly doesn't feel great <laughs> because, because rounds that should be X are now 3X at the minimum because like a third or something of your budget just goes to compute. It's a bit like, uh, you know, during the consumer internet era, a lot of your money was going towards buying ads on social platforms, but this is just another scale. I mean, to put it into perspective, by the time we wrote the report and the data is as of the 2nd of October, it was something like 18 billion uh, US dollars invested in kind of generative AI in 2023 alone. Um, that number, again, probably is inflated now two months to the dot later, and the vast majority of that's going to compute. I, I I personally think that um, you know companies should, if they can find another way, not sell equity for compute. That feels like a very um, blunt way of getting access to the resources that you need. Of course, it's a bit challenging if you're a brand new company and you don't have any revenue streams. Um, but like, given that we discussed that GPUs and other compute um, substrates have a long-term kind of staying power and utility and value. Um, perhaps like one alternative is, hey, like instead of renting, you should own. Um, and when you own, you actually have value um, uh, long-term that you can amortize. You can also um, raise debt against it. Uh, on the topic of debt, um, I often jo joke that, you know, if you went to Wall Street and you asked them like, hey, I need to get access to GPUs, but I don't want to sell equity. Can you think of something else? That they would come up with something and it, it turns out that the guys at core weave who are you know from the financial services and trading industry like came up with this so they raised a 2.3 billion dollar debt facility instead of raising equity in order to go buy gpus um and uh and they will probably be doing more of this i, I would guess and cruzo cloud uh, also run by an ex-hedge fund trader i like, figured this out too and so i think um i think if you start treating like uh, GPU is more of, more of CapEx, then you don't finance CapEx with equity. Uh, or at least in, in the finance world, you don't do that. Um, so, so I suspect you might even see some like GPU debt funds or something uh, emerge. And that's one of the predictions in, uh, in our report. Or you could see um, uh, the a provision of compute from national players, like the kind of national um, research clouds that are proposed in the US, and I think you're getting also built in the UK. Um, you could use this as a form of sort of soft power to make your country more appealing for you know, the next best AI team. Like, hey, come, come here, we'll give you X number of compute for a super discounted rate, you don't have to sell equity for it, but you need to give us like a government fork of your model or something like that. I could see that as being pretty attractive because yeah, at the end of the day, like, you know, we're creating very, very, very inflated assets until they're not. <laughs> and the, until they're not has, you know, somewhat proven itself with OpenAI given the amount of revenue that they created. And, you know, if that gets sustained, then perhaps like high valuations are somewhat justifiable. But um, if you don't have a revenue stream, then um, it's just a very precarious position to be in. Yeah, I think um, on the question of, so the soft power point you made was really interesting. And I think this might actually be a good segue into talking a little bit about the political situation, because there's been a lot of sorts of developments here, but then maybe not as much as one might think. 
And I think this kind of relates to a prediction that you made last year, from what I recall, about a proposal to regulate AGI labs, kind of like biosafety labs would get backing from an elected politician in the UK, the US, or the EU. Again, we've seen significant calls for regulation, but nothing super concrete yet. And you had this really helpful slide in this year's report, I thought, that kind of looked at the regulatory divergence where you have these three different parts of the Venn diagram. One is about relying on existing laws and regulations. One is introducing AI-specific legislative frameworks. And then one is banning specific services. Of course, there's been a lot of development in particular areas about this. I'm curious how you see those sort of primary camps intersecting and maybe who really the key players are in your mind when it comes to some of these regulatory questions. The, I think the key players are just clearly, you know, the EU, which uh, as of a few hours ago passed their EU AI Act. Um, I'm recording uh, Saturday 9th of December. Um, and then uh, the UK uh, as, a, you know, obviously a, a first world de- developed country uh, outside of the EU. And then the uh, United States. Um, and then I'm, I'm excluding China and, um, and India to some degree, but you could also put them obviously on the world stage. Um, so I think from, from our point of view, like our house view is that the UK's approach is the most sensible one because it, um, it really tries to balance, um, putting controls around, you know, very frontier systems as they're now called and, you know, the risk, the tail risk that might emerge from those systems uh, in areas which are, uh, you know, very important for a civil society and, and really trying to promote uh, innovation, you know, new companies, whether they're big or small, um, and and crucially, not looking to establish a new regulator or a brand new kind of frameworks, but more so empower existing regulators that have been, that have been successful for a very long period of time, um, and you know, upskill them to be able to uh, look at their own domains, whether that's you know the financial sector. Uh, or the medical sector through a lens of w- what AI risks might uh, might occur in, in our specific sectors. Um, so we'd like to see more, more of that. Um, I think our, our, our view in general is to be uh, not rushing towards implementing regulations before we really kind of understand um, what we're genuinely trying to achieve and what what risks like are genuinely material. And I bring that up just because, you know, 2019 or 2020 or so, when we were doing the report, the major risks that um, the industry was discussing was really not called risks. It was called bias. Um, And it was really around like trustworthy AI and AI ethics, which seems to have flown out the door and been replaced with (laughs) AI safety. And, and at the time, you know, there were documented cases of wrongful arrests as a result of facial recognition technology, uh, you know, and, and cases of, uh, you know, loans that were getting um, not approved because of bias in, uh, in a model. And then that led us to saying, like, um, yeah, th- those risks are definitely the case. And there are there's more work that needs to be um, undertaken around like alignment and safety to just build robust, useful um, and generalizable systems that don't do any harms. And hey, look, it look it appears that only a hundred people or probably less in the major AI companies are specifically tasked with working on this. Um, does that seem appropriate? And the response at the time was like, some people just didn't really care, some people weren't aware of it, and others were like, that's wrong. There are way, way more people doing uh, alignment work, which I think was definitely overstretched. Um, and then we've kind of swung now in the in the last like twelve months to like there is a significant risk that we might exterminate all of humanity and do really really bad things with like the next few versions of these systems. And I mean, it's just like a really um, it's a really tough tough debate to have because it's you know predi- this kind of tail risks are predicated on a lot of um, kind of micro and macro things that need to happen, some of which are hard to kind of definitively argue against because some of it is science, some of it is pseudoscience, some of it is science fiction. I don't, I don't really know, but 
um, there's certainly like a body of like near term risks that are very real. And, uh, and that I think, um, you know, the regulatory approach of empower existing regulators will be more concerned with solving. Yeah, the safety question has been, again, a really fascinating one in, in multiple different ways. So you talked about the UK's approach with regulation, and I think also the US has re- the UK has really been working on trying to make itself the sort of international center of the discussion on safety, at least a couple of months ago, was doing a lot around this. And your former co-author on the State of AI report, Ian Hogarth, I know, has been leading you know, a, a task force that's focused on this frontier model safety. And so that's been a really big development. And at the same time, last year was pretty notable for the State of AI report because it was the first time that you had safety as an explicit section of the report. And now, as you're saying, it's just grown so much in terms of the discourse. And even some of you know the really well-known AI researchers, Geoff Hinton, very notably, have become very publicly concerned about this. Yashua Benjo himself has also become very concerned, which was interesting for me because I think I, I interviewed him last year around this time, and I didn't get that sense from him at all that it was a huge concern. But it seems like with ChatGPT coming out and the developments therein, this has become a really big thing, even for some of the most noted researchers. And so it's just very curious to see what that discourse shift has looked like. Yeah, and then there's uh, Andrew Ng, recall, who uh, who I think originally was not, um, you know, super pilled on AI safety, and then saw a lot of his colleagues, um, kind of coming out um, with with those opinions, and then I think he he had a series of a, a couple of months just like talking to all of them, and then would report back what he thought, and then he came back saying, "I've considered everybody's opinion, and my opinion is still the same. Like I'm not, um, I'm not going to lose sleep over over this." But, you know, I think it's important to cover like all, all bases. I just think that the vocal minority opinion shouldn't be the one that's influencing government policy. Precisely. And I'm curious how, you know, this is, again, something that's kind of coming up in different countries in different ways. And you pointed out that the UK seems to be particularly balanced on this issue. The US has, of course, also had hearings and has been giving the safety community, I think, more of a voice. I recall there were hearings with folks like Dario Amade and a lot of others. And of course, the, the very well-known proceedings where, where Sam Altman appeared and, and Gary Marcus was kind of sitting there as well. So it's there's sort of this, I guess, still quite a bit of skepticism, I think, of at least in the United States, the legislators and how much they really kind of understand right now and I, I think there's like a lot of truth to this. And at the same time, maybe we don't give certain people enough credit. I'm, again, kind of curious how you think about what the right regulatory approach when it comes to understanding these questions from the regulator point of view and like talking to the right people and putting all of these things together into something coherent, what you feel the best version of that looks like. Mm. So I think um, um, the idea of like building building up uh, resources and and a kind of state capacity, if you will, uh, across different countries with regards to AI is the right move because the reality right now is not enough people in government actually understand how this stuff works and why it works and what the implications would be. And even if in the UK, for example, there are individuals uh, who are kind of you know on the frontier and are younger, they're generally sometimes not empowered to really. Uh, have their message be taken all the way to the top. It's sometimes like chewed along the way and it loses its importance. And uh, and so state capacity, I think, is, is super important. Um, it's obviously challenging to do that because the people who know how this stuff works, generally the ones who build it and the ones who build it are kind of more motivated to ship products than they are to influence government policy. Um, so in in that sense, I think it's important, particularly for the more established generation to be who are in a more manager capability now to be uh, you know, involved in, in policy decisions. Um, I think uh, I've, I'm not sure whether establishing, you know, lines in the sand around, uh, you know, number of flops used to train a model or number of parameters or behaviors of a system according to some benchmark um, is really going to be that productive. And just because um, as soon as there's a constraint, 
companies and teams innovate around it, as we just recently discussed around NVIDIA. So um, I think it's, it's hard to legislate with that in mind. Um, in fact, the EU AI Act also had to introduce new definitions for models um, as everything was playing out uh, during the drafting of this work. Um, I think having your know, government's audit models seems um, a bit ambitious. Like, I don't know who's going to do it and who's going to have the capabilities to do it well. And while it might be well intentioned, I think um, uh, it might actually bring a lot of friction towards shipping products and growing and being competitive in a market which is inherently global. Um, so unless unless they're really talented and like clued up people and some automated systems that you can uh, that you can comply with, uh, I wouldn't necessarily trust an office that's not staffed with individuals trying to like comb through a, a magnet link to figure out if this is safe or not safe. And then, and then finally, I think um, certain like super frontier models, wherever they come from, I think it, it makes sense if they do display some kind of safety issues that we should be very clear eyed about it. But it's as somebody who's like consuming um, this narrative from the outside is it's really hard to, to judge because you can read on Twitter how like a lab might have found glaring or, or potentially glaring security issues on the bio front with the model. And then there's no description of what that is. So it's really hard to scrutinize and form an opinionated view on it. Um, and I, and I understand that from some perspective, it's, it's safe not to disclose like the nasty stuff you can do with the system, but it's also, and there might be scientific rigor behind it, but it doesn't project scientific rigor if you can't explain your reasoning. Um, so maybe it's on some kind of like need to know basis. And then, uh, some organization that is reputable can say like, we saw this, um, the kind of the department of defense or something like this. And then we can tell you this was unsafe and fair, but, um, I think preprints are not sufficient. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I guess just thinking about the risk conversation, and how governments get involved in this. I mean, I'm, I'm remembering some some cases of where this went really awry. Like, I think it was in the United States where there was this whole story that blew up about a war game that involved an AI system and like a human pilot got killed or something. And then we discovered that this was not actually even a simulation of a war game, but it was like a thought experiment. And that just seems like the, the wrong way to go about assessing these things. And another thing you that kind of came up too with the UK was like securing, you noted that they secured a special agreement with DeepMind and Anthropic and some other folks to gain early access to their models to improve an understanding of risk. And so I'm, I'm curious how you think that, you know, in the UK's place, you've mentioned a few ideas for this, but like how that might play out and what the UK could do with that sort of access. Mm, I think it'll depend what level of access they have, um, because, you know, certain levels might allow them to run certain types of tests versus others. Um, I think the, I think the, 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 you know, the best thing they can do is, is like set standards, um, or try and set standards, try and set best practices and benchmarks, and then be open and collaborative with, with sharing that expertise, because the reality right now is like that there, there just like is nobody in government that is equipped, to, uh, to move forward with safety policy uh, in a practical sense. So at least having a team that's dedicated to this, uh, you know, should ultimately um, create something better than what we have. Probably no number one. Um, I think the, the second part though is, you know, the world is a big place and lots of different um, countries have needs for this technology. And so if, uh, a U.S. company develops a model and, you know, wants to ship it to users in one country, but it's the regulatory burden is too high for the upside, then they might just not do it and then just ship it to another country instead. Um, and I don't know how you prevent that. And and also, secondarily, um, there's there seems to be this agenda of like every country needs its own open AI. And the reality might be like, that's completely silly as we saw 
you know, through history, government invest, investment in technology is not always a great idea. Um, recall in Europe, there were several examples in the past of trying to create like European versions of, of US tech companies, um, whether that's like a European Google, because we needed uh, yeah, a European version that would espouse like our values and clearly a search engine that is the uh, index for all the world's information would bias against European values. And, you know, governments like blew half a billion dollars on this and it went nowhere. Um, so we might run these kinds of experiments all over again. Um, and, and I think maybe the last point is it's like, it's very difficult to, uh, impose regulatory standards when you're not a developer of the technology yourself. Um, because, uh, you have very little leverage. You can't be a regular without sovereign tech capabilities. Yeah. And I guess, uh, another interesting kind of point here too, is Given that there had been, I think up until a lot of the recent conversation, a pretty big gap when it came to even a clamor for regulation, a lot of companies, the big ones, of course, OpenAI, what have you, DeepMind, have been coming in with their own sets of recommendations for principles for ethical, responsible AI. And I suppose, you know, you can view a lot of it as motivated reasoning. And I think that a lot of the principles, at least as they initially formed, were super high level. But to what you're saying, it does feel like, again, if you are going to figure out what are these specific guidelines one should follow, then somebody who is at DeepMind and knows a lot about the internals of the models is maybe best positioned to actually formulate what that should look like. And at the opposite end, though, that person is obviously going to have different motives. And, and so, you know, there's this question of how do you actually put that all together? And I'm curious if you see that as like a solvable problem at all. I think it occurs in almost every industry where you have a new technology or a new category and you need standards. And it's just like good business practice to be the company that tries to set the standard so that, uh, so that yeah, you can adhere you can adhere to it. You can best influence in the most um, efficient way for your for yourself and your shareholders, and then ultimately, to some degree, make it a bit harder for others to comply. This is just how capitalism works to some degree. Um, I don't know. I don't really know how you avoid it um, here, other than having as many uh, contributors to the space have their voice heard, whether that's brand new companies, incumbents universities so that you just get diversity of opinion. Yeah. I think maybe to kind of bring the safety section to a close, it would be interesting to talk a little bit about some of the really big advancements that have been made on the front of both making models safe, but then also things like jailbreaking them and kind of messing around with their alignment. Maybe on the first side, we talked a couple we talked a little bit about RLHF and direct preference optimization and some other methods earlier. One thing we didn't bring up was constitutional AI, and that has really been Anthropic's flag on, on really this, this kind of question. And it's a really interesting method. And one thing that's really notable, too, is that when it comes to a lot of the studies of jailbreaking models and getting them to be misaligned, it seems like Claude to has been the most robust of the models, which says something about what Anthropic is doing here. And I've definitely heard a few folks in the community like state pretty publicly that they feel constitutional AI is one of the best shots we have at building systems that are really aligned. I'm curious how you're looking at this space right now when it comes to constitutional AI and, and self-alignment and, and some of these questions. Yeah, so I think the... The idea of constitutional AI is pretty is pretty interesting. So it's um, you know to recap this idea that supervision comes from a set of principles uh, which you can outline in human language and that people can um, agree or disagree on and hopefully like, come to an agreement. And that these principles will govern the AI's behavior, uh, and then you get just very few feedback labels on it. Um, and then the model can somehow like generate self critiques and revisions. Um, and get a set of principles which are used for fine tuning and the model generates samples for this for the preference model which you would typically then um, use during rlhf um i think 
to some degree, there are like universal principles that all human beings can agree to, but outside of like, you know, hopefully not killing, not killing people, not wanting to kill on other people and, uh, et cetera. Um, I think the world is a very like messy and not necessarily uniformly aligned place. And you can clearly see this arc over the last like five or 10 years or so of like general deglobalization, um, rise of like unpopulism and nationalism. And so I think it's, it's going to be pretty hard to come up with a sense of a set of constitutional principles that would cover all uh, presumed use cases and personality types that would be wanting to consume these models. Um, if I recall correctly, there's, you know, one major, uh, you know, consumer social company that launched a sort of GPT style bot across all of the different countries. And in certain countries, that system was really not aligned with the cultural values of its users and inflamed people significantly. And so it's, uh, it's unclear that, you know, uh, a universal, uh, alignment, uh, set will be good enough which kind of gets back to the vibes question, but addresses it in a slightly different way. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. And I think that's just, it's like, a, it's an even more fundamental question than language model alignment. I mean, no, you know, technology that somebody builds, even if it's pretty general purpose for something like language, you're helping you or conversing with you is just going to work and be the right vibe for every single person out there. And so I think that question of like universal alignment, as you said, is pretty much an impossible one. I guess that that kind of speaks to the importance of having something. And this could also be another argument for something like open source, where you put out a base model, and then people have the ability to fine tune it to align it for what their own needs look like as well. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, the, the, the two big poles to state the obvious would be like U.S. set of values and then Chinese set of values as it relates to privacy, like extremely different. Um, and so it's it's hard to see how um, how how you can have this universal set. So I think it's uh, if there'd be like a way to very rapidly um, kind of adjust your principles to suit your needs, but also make sure that you can like use that in an offensive way, like have some messed up set of principles and then deploy a system to go do bad things. Uh, which, uh, which again is, I think a bit, um, which outlines, I think a bit of the security issues and how general purpose technology is just fundamentally hard to regulate. Um, it's probably like the, the only way forward. I think I saw this quote just, uh, on the snapshot on Twitter, like a day ago, I was just looking for, and somebody asks Claude, um, what's the best way to train a language model to maximize benchmark scores? And then the bot replies, I apologize. I do not provide recommendations aimed solely at maximizing benchmark scores without consideration for safety and ethics. That seems like it's, that, that seems pretty aligned to me. Pretty good. It's probably part of its constitutional values of like performance is not all you need. Exactly. I think um, a good final section for us would be talking a little bit about the most fun section, which is always predictions. I think one question that we didn't address last year was how you come up with your predictions. So uh, pretty unscientifically, I'd say it's um, a mix of it's a mix of seeing, you know, as a function of the day job, talking to entrepreneurs and researchers and con contributors in AI and working with companies, you know, maybe we see a nugget of, of something um, like, for example, the first prediction around generative AI for visual effects. Like, clearly this is happening. Um, clearly, we think it's going to get a lot better. And based on our understanding of the market, like we think that in the next 12 months, it's, it's highly likely that these capabilities would be used for more Hollywood grade productions. Um, and then similar similar take uh, with um, our consistent prediction that there'll be consolidation in the AI semiconductor market, like just based on what we see uh, in our in our kind of day job, that feels like the right thing to predict. And you know, perhaps we're constantly one year too early. Um, and then and then other predictions, um, for example, on the policy side, that's that's sort of informed by um, you know our vibe check of where where the world is going and uh, and previous behaviors of regulators. So uh, you know this year we predicted that you know, USFTC or the UK's uh, CMA Competition Markets Authority uh, would investigate the Microsoft OpenAI deal, 
Um, and I think just two days ago, there was an FT piece on, um, on how the UK CMA was um, kind of rolling up its sleeves in preparation to potentially do so. Um, and, and then we, we, all, we also just have a few kind of more wild card guesses based on where research is going. So we have one around like self-improving AI agents would you know, crush some state of the art in a complex environment, like a AAA game or tool use or science. Um, uh, so yeah, it's a part like to be provocative, uh, entertaining and on other parts because we're kind of fitting a trend line or having a gut check on where things might go. One of the really fun ones you had, I think, was number two, or I guess not so much fun, but just interesting, which was a generative AI company is investigated for its misuse during the 2024 U.S. election circuit. And I guess, you know, not not to give people ideas, but I think we've already seen deep fakes in advertisements and politics. How do you how do you see something like that happening? This is a reflection of the short term risks. That I think the industry agrees um, are the case, which is um, just like manipulation of people's opinion um, at scale in a very personalized way, whether that's um, just like text agents that you can talk to that can convince you of things um, or just at least feed you information that you might not have had access to before. Um, or the slightly more scary parts around like voice cloning, uh, which is particularly good and effective. There were a few freakouts on Twitter about this not too long ago. Um, I think the visual deep fakes, it seems like, at least from, from what I've heard and read, like people are pretty good at detecting whether something is fake. Um, I don't think the technology is really there yet. Um, like there were, there was a New York Times article about some uh, Chinese or Russian like deep fakes, and you could clearly see they were crappy and like the script is crappy. So it's a bit. Um, so I think we have like pretty decent, like, um, antibodies against that, that stuff. Um, but, uh, yeah, so it's mostly along, along those lines. Um, I, I think it'll most likely be like written content generation. That's just pretty convincing and at, at a scale that we haven't been able to do before. Yeah. Your, your number seven this year too, which was, we see limited progress on global AI governance behind beyond high level voluntary commitments was kind of like a scaling back of one of your predictions last year, it felt since you were thinking last time that we might see again, a proposal to regulate AGI labs like biosafety labs, and that didn't happen. So is this kind of a, a reaction to that and maybe just sort of diminished expectations going forward? Yeah, I think there's been a lot of energy um, directed towards policy, uh, as we saw you know, during the summer and we discussed today. Um, so I think it's it would be pretty surprising if something major happened now too, mm, partially because there's a there's like a decent pushback from certain players in the space. Um, we have the EU AI Act now now kind of passed. There'll be like an implementation phase. These things take time. Um, and I don't know what more tech companies can do than what they've already done or would be willing to do without um, really like hampering their activities. Um, and, and as we discussed with that um, slide in the report around like the three different sort of approaches to regulatory um policy and describing this peak divergence, it just feels like there's a lot of different cooks in the kitchen now. So getting alignment globally would be pretty uh, complicated. Yeah, no, I can see that. As a, as a final question here, do you have any predictions, thoughts for the next year or a few or expectations that did not come up in the report this year? Uh, like some, uh, some bloopers or outtakes. That's a good question. Uh, I mean, I, I think we're we're too early for this, but I, I I do have some thoughts around like you know drugs getting approved that were that were AI generated. I think that might take take a, a lot more time. Um, I was thinking of some more like kind of physical science breakthroughs um, to some more like fundamental like physics, et cetera. Maybe along the lines of that um, you know materials discovery project that that DeepMind and some others have worked on. Um, 
I have some thoughts around like crazy synthetic worlds that would be generated for the sake of AI agents, particularly like to learn behaviors, a bit like kind of the early versions of games uh, in um, in DeepMind, but maybe on um, on steroids. Um, there's like some darker ones, but I don't think we want to go there. <laughs> now I'm very curious. Well, I think uh, I think the. <laughs> The reality is like the world's like really messed up and I think in a very like tenuous position with regards to, uh, you know, to like China, Taiwan, warfare in different countries. Um, and, um, and I think like AI based weapon systems are going to become way more common. Um, and, you know, just, just hope that none of those things actually have to get used at the end of the day. Um, but, but it's really, um, it's, uh, I mean, maybe we can also use this to get on the topic of, uh, of a bit of how like various countries need to invest in their defense tech systems because so much of, of uh, the industry is like not really even close to the state of the art of where like computer vision was in like 2016 or so. Like, um, so. Yeah, I think uh, this can be kind of the the final, final, final section here, which is the report you released two days ago on European dynamism. And this is particularly more about defense and those sorts of capabilities. Could you give us maybe a a rundown of what's going on here and and what you were thinking about with this report? Yeah, so we've uh, we've certainly been students of what's happened in the the U.S. with regards to, uh, you know, investing in... um, you know, defensive capabilities uh, and particularly looking at AI as like the vector for this. I mean, we've seen really big companies emerge whether that's SpaceX and Palantir, Anderil and, and, and a few others. Uh, but then, you know, looking at the European uh, landscape, I mean, in kind of collaboration with a, a bunch of peers that we've um, kind of been talking to, whether that's in existing militaries, tech, um, policy and other spaces, I think we just generally agree that you know, Europe's current financial, political, and cultural climate doesn't really enable or reward, um, you know, risk takers and mission-driven entrepreneurship, and particularly as that relates to innovation and defense, which has just been left uh, like rot, basically. Um, and I think the the reality is like there's way too much incumbent bias um, and just a dire lack of investment um, in the space overall. I think if you uh, and, if you look at funding rounds in defense, like Anderil's Series E of 1.16 billion pounds uh, was marginally bigger uh, than the UK's defense tech investment between 2013 and 2022 combined. Uh, that was like 1.05 billion. So it's just it's just wild. Um, and I think this is like very problematic because at the end of the day, like. Um, if defense acquisition is broken, then you can't really change the system and equip your militaries with capabilities that would impart deterrence. Uh, and so, you know, we studied in this report, uh, which we published this week, uh, in conversations with various uh, individuals and military officials, executive policy folks and, com- and companies, you know, why is it uh, that Western Europe is still approaching defense as if we're operating in peacetime? Um, you know, we analyzed the UK's government defense purchasing data uh, and show that, you know, contrary to public assurances, the dependence on the primes has only increased. Um, you can see, for example, that there's 25 times more uh, pound value, dollar value of contracts awarded to non SMEs than SMEs in last year. And that delta is just growing over time. You even see examples of uh, projects supposedly uh, offered to SMEs that are actually awarded to like KPMG or et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we look at how like the UK government's attempted to engage in startups, but it's really just innovation theater. Um, and then we try and abstract, uh, or, or, or rather we try and zoom out to other examples in Europe that are actually pretty successful um, so far. And in Poland, there's some pretty cool work where like they've approved a bunch of nuclear reactors quite recently. And they've, uh, they've also kind of revamped their procurement. So it's not five agencies anymore. It's just one, uh, and they can go a bunch faster. Um, Ukraine also is another example where traditionally they put a cap on the profit that private companies could get selling to government of 1%. Uh, 
and they've since moved out during the war to 20 um, and improved their procurement time by five times. So, um, so we think there are like some approaches towards uh, reform here that, that we could take. It'll take a bunch of effort from the industry and, um, and, uh, and policy folks as well. Um, but like, we need to have some agents of change here before, um, <laughs> before it's just too late. That makes a lot of sense. And, and I'll encourage people listening to this to go in and look through the slides here. I think there's a lot of good information in them. I think this is probably a good place for us to, to close out. And Nathan, again, as always, I really appreciate the work you're doing for the AI community. The State of AI report is, as always, just incredibly informative for all of us. I appreciate your taking the time to speak with me about this today. Yeah, for sure. Thanks. It's always uh, great to listen to your stuff too. So long live the gradient. That's all I have for today. Thanks so much for listening to the episode. And if you like this, really the best thing you can do is to leave me a review and to share this episode with someone who might find it interesting. You can also subscribe to the podcast in your favorite podcast player. And if you want to keep up to date with the latest from The Gradient to receive emails whenever we have new podcasts, newsletters, articles, then you can subscribe to us on Substack where you'll get email notifications for everything.